It's time now for World Watchers International with Nay Brussel, who for over 17 years has investigated and exposed political conspiracies worldwide. World Watchers International originates at KLRB, Carmel, California. Here's May. Good evening. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California. This is a first for the nine years that I've been on the air. There's a listener in New Jersey who wanted to hear the program back there, went back for graduation, a member of the family, and he listens to it usually at UC Santa Cruz. So the telephone is piped in and the broadcasting uh, setup is there so their family can hear it on the telephone in New Jersey while we're on the air in Carmel, California. Before we get into the question and the motives behind who shot J.P. the second, uh, irreverently I refer to him as J.P. the second, and those of you who are not familiar with the broadcast and nine years of broadcasting, I must say that I strip most public figures down to the occasions of who they meet, where they profit, how they came to power, how they hold the power, who they know, and uh, what are they doing with their lives. I'm not impressed by the oath of office of President of the United States, whether it's Richard Nixon or Lyndon Johnson, or certainly Ronald Reagan, and heads of states and religious leaders, uh, the same goes for them. If they behave like religious leaders, I respect them. And when they're on the fringe of the mob with narcotics, traffic, and gang wars, and uh, international terrorism of their own kind, I like to see what place they fit into those scenes. And I am indeed irreverent. I apologize. Before we get on to the subject of the shooting of John Paul II, I do want to mention a subject which is very close to the research that I've done through the years, and that's the killing off of the culture, the so-called subculture, we refer to the third world, but in this country it is the music leaders, the message in the music and the musicians that have died off, and I often uh, give a brief mention of the recent ones who have died. Uh, Bob Marley died this week. Another voice is silenced. Uh, some people may think he had too much marijuana and it went to his brain. Uh, I don't know if he had Jack Ruby cancer or Martha Mitchell cancer. He certainly was a active political activist in every sense of the word in Jamaican politics. He was shot in Kingston in Jamaica in 1976. He lived through that assassination attempt uh, but he died this week of brain cancer. The same week or the week before he was dying of brain cancer, it was announced uh, in the newspaper spotlight that Ro Nelson, Ro David Rockefeller rather, is getting a hush-hush post moving into Jamaica. Tyrol Bay in Jamaica, Montega Bay, is the headquarters for the resurgence of the Nazi movement all over the world after World War II. And David Rockefeller is stepping down, has stepped down as head of Chase Manhattan Bank to move into Jamaica, where William Stevenson of British intelligence and Reinhard Galen of German intelligence and Alan Dulles, who formed the CIA, have had a nest of spies in his property owned there by John Connolly and people that worked with Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, Albert Osborne was there. And it's an international nest of spies, and unfortunately, Bob Marley was singing songs of oppression and slavery in a better world uh, right under the nose of these people. Also, another article in the Wall Street Journal, Money Returns to Troubled Jamaica. Uh, now that the election is over and Harvard's uh, hand-picked Siaga was put into power in Jamaica, uh, the, the powers that be are pouring their money into it. We did this in Chile when Allende was elected. The World Bank, the international bankers, put all their money in to bankrupt the country so that by the time he was murdered, uh, people thought that they would have another shake at a fair opportunity or job opportunity, which they haven't had in Chile at all, but they got fascism. But the World Bankers pour money in once the undesirable has been killed and or moved out of office. And in this case, they handpicked Mr. Siega and, uh, so that they could begin pouring money in. Another article, Jamaica's uh, bank rolls, the Inter-Monetary uh, Fund and, and that group pour money into the election of Siega and the Workers' Viewpoint had an article, at least 700 deaths accomplished the takeover. It reminds me of the way we have elections in the United States. It takes about that many under the cover to silence many people, writers, judges, lawyers, political activists, 
young people organizing in order to uh, get these particular candidates into office. This is the way we do it, and we help them do it around the world. Now, to get to the question of who shot uh, John Paul II, this can't be answered in one week, and when there are murder such as Nelson Rockefeller or John Lennon or an attempt on Ronald Reagan's life or on the Pope's life, it usually involves a three-part series to set the groundwork, three weeks on uh, the Jonestown affair, and then I update these programs in the weeks that follow or for years to come. But it takes at least three hours to set the groundwork on studying uh, these assassination attempts because they get uh, complicated they're simple and complicated at the same time. If you understand the network, you can untangle it. But as they interweave with each other, um, it takes that much background for a person new to listening to these broadcasts to get used to my logic or the way I'm thinking. And then through the years, if they follow it steadily, they can put the pieces together and they're on their own figuring it out. Now, on KLRB, two, several weeks ago, uh, that was tape 490, this is 493, it was four weeks ago, I mentioned an article in the Washington Post that sounded so ridiculous, I almost couldn't read it without laughing. It was called The Cult Leader in the Area Probed After Threats, and it was about this man with a ridiculous name, uh, Mr. Daspatch, Fernando L. Daspatch, D-A-S-B-A-C-H. Uh, with a German wife, Anna Marie, and they set out a declaration of war against religion. Uh, the, they have an organization that is linked to the Maharaji. It's an offshoot of the Maharaji group that came into this country in the 70s, and they call themselves the Reagan Bogan Verlock. Uh, translated, is supposed to mean, I don't know German, the uh, rainbow, and they have various p priests in saffron robes. And uh, he's come out with the terms of uh, the declaration of war, and he came out with them March the 15th, and Ronald Reagan was shot March the 30th. And he said that uh, in his declaration of war, people will die by tens of thousands, and that there will be no Jew on the planet Earth by the year 2001. That's 20 years from now. But he said Reagan will die first. This was March the 15th, 1981, that he'd begin with Ronald Reagan, and then he said uh, Hatfield, Senator Hatfield, would also be killed. Now, in the vote of the Pentagon budget, I believe that everyone in the Senate voted with Ronald Reagan except Senator Hatfield, which was interesting uh, this week because he had mentioned him as the number one target. He said Reagan will die first, and then all heads will roll, but first the heads of the priests. They're the first to be sacrificed. So uh, after he published this, one just a week after that, or two weeks rather, Ronald Reagan was shot, and within a month, the Pope was shot. Now, this man has connections to Germany, and the assailant, this Mahatma Ali Aj, shot, the, shot at the Pope, not only had accomplices all over the world, but lived in Germany, had a German wife similar to this Mr. Daspash, and three or four times, Germany refused to extradite him to Turkey. He had killed a liberal newspaper editor in Turkey and was wanted on a murder charge. And they knew that he was involved with a very far, far right Nazi group that I'll get into, farther right than the conservatives in that government. And that military hunter that came in in September of last year is a torturous, uh, terrible regime. It was written up in the New York Times. Amnesty International had been attacking them. This guy is really going for the racks and the torture instruments such as the Shah of Iran had as against making somebody sit in a chair five days to be interrogated. The right gets farther right, and he belonged to that group. And um, this, I don't know how seriously whether this Dasbach is to laugh at or not, but because he mentioned these things and said the priest would be next after Regan, and it went in that order, I thought I would bring it up again. Now, as far as killing the Pope or uh, shooting him, all the news media give uh, questions. Who would kill such a nice man at such a senseless shooting? First of all, none of these things are senseless. There's no such thing unless somebody's clinging a gun and it happens to go off and hit somebody, ricochet. These large assassinations are not senseless. And another point is that this Pope isn't universally loved. This is a PR 
of a lot of people pushing a man who looks good in a white flowing silk robe against a blue sky kissing babies. You can't be all bad if you're doing that and kissing the ground of the place where your airplane lands. But beyond that, when you shed the robes, I imagine Stark naked, he's no different than Earl Warren. And Earl Warren was put into office by Murray Chotner, an organized crime, and the syndicate from way back. Uh, I'm not saying that he's all bad, but he has a lot of enemies. And because he has a sweet smile and a sweet face, it doesn't mean that some people don't want to shoot him. And the fact is that a lot of people did and that this Aji wasn't working alone for sure. Uh, he walked out of a prison. He had help when he walked out of prison in Turkey. He was dressed as a military officer. He left a note because the Pope was coming to Turkey, and he threatened he would kill the Pope if he came. He didn't say when he would kill him. He left the letter there, and this is a New York Times article, uh, May the 14th, the day after the shooting. Um, he threatened if the Pope came to Turkey, he would kill him. And this is the quotation of what he had in the letter. Western imperialists are afraid of Turkey's unity of politics military and economic power with brotherly Islamic countries. And they are sending Crusader Commander John Paul under the mask of a religious leader. Now, a lot of Catholics would take issue of whether or not he is a religious leader or has a mask of being a religious leader. But whatever you think, Mr. Aji had another opinion, and I'm telling you what he said when he was let out by the Turkish police and said he would be out to kill the Pope. He said if this ill-timed and meaningless visit of the Pope is not called off to Turkey, I will definitely shoot the Pope. That is the only reason I escaped from prison. Well, if that's the only reason he escaped, then it's the only reason they let him escape because one policeman was just arrested for letting him out of the jail and he did, in fact, get a pot shot at the Pope. Uh, he's talking about economic uh, problems in Turkey, political, military, and economic. And when I get into the fourth uh, motive for trying to shoot the Pope, uh, which I think I have five motives, and I'll rule out several of them and go over them with you as much as time allows and continue in the next few weeks. Economic is a good reason, and I'm, I'll go into more depth than I have tonight on the narcotic war that has taken place in Turkey when Richard Nixon in 1971 paid the Turkish government between 30 million and 100 million dollars to cut off the opium supply. He said, I'm going to have a war on drugs. And as he paid the Turkish government to cut off opium, he allowed the Shah of Iran to increase his poppy fields 50 percent more than anything Turkey would have, and he brought in narcotics from Southeast Asia and tried to dry up the hashish uh, heroin uh, deals coming in from Lebanon, Afghanistan, Turkey, and that golden arch in that area. Uh, Richard Nixon was put in by organized crime, as I say, Murray Chotner and that gang. And in essence, uh, it was really the Sicilian mafia that profited after World War II or uh, sent the uh, uh, CIA and the OSS mingled with British intelligence, German intelligence, Lucky Luciano, and began to tighten up their control of the narcotic market. Now, the Corsican market was going through Marseille, and this may get a little complicated in who shot the Pope, but the Corsican mo uh, heroin came from Turkey. And in Richard Nixon's effort to bring in the White House plumbers and Lieutenant Conin and his own uh, gang, his own gang, he redirected the geography of the world for narcotic traffic, cutting off and drying up the Marseille, Corsican, Turkey connections while profiting at his end. Now, Richard Nixon was very close to Pope Paul VI, Montini, and I'll go into details later on that and the Watergate clique and the investment of the Vatican money into uh, the Watergate Hotel, the Pan Am building in Europe, the uh, Gulf and Western the Paramount Studios in Hollywood. Vatican money was taken by Pope Paul VI, who was the godfather and mentor of John Paul II. John Paul VI lived 33 days and was 
pushed out. And this mentor, the guy, the man who worked with him in Italy right after World War II with Montini when his secretary of the Vatican, this pope had strong interlocking links uh, directly, personally, and otherwise to the Richard Nixon, the uh, Bibi Rebozo, the, the um, Sicilian, the Meyer Lansky, the Santos Traficanta, the Southeast Asian, and then developing the Colombian and the uh, Bolivian and the Peru narcotics and trying to strangle off the uh, arch of the narcotics coming in from the Middle East, from Turkey and Lebanon, and strangling them and stopping the flow of those narcotics. During the period when Jimmy Carter was president and the Shah of Iran was out, I did many broadcasts on the narcotic war between the Carter clique, which was the Middle Eastern group, by letting the Shah out our heroin and narcotics poured in this country 30 and 40 percent more than when uh, before. And the Atlanta, Georgia, and this goes into the George Habash connections because the minute Ajah was arrested, he said, I work with George Habash. So in essence, I'm jumping the gun to possible motives. But I, I'm getting to the point because when he left Turkey, he accused the United States of interfering with the economic rights and the imperialists coming in and interfering with their traffic. And when he accused John Paul of hiding under the mask of a religious leader, it would be hard to uh, take all the accumulated evidence that's been in the news of the last two years of the of the Vatican right now to organize crime and wonder what in the heck the Vatican has to do with organized crime, narcotics, traffic, the Gambino family, and such. So when this Aji was uh, left the Turkish jail, he'd been arrested for killing a liberal newspaper man. He belongs to the Grey Wolves, a fanatic right-wing group, but they also want uh, America to lay their hands off of Turkey. Last week or the week before, Ronald Reagan said Turkey is vital to the United States. Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. We want to squeeze it into our NATO alliance. We need Turkey. But I don't know if Turkey needs us, the Western world, anymore. You see, there are several facts that you have to understand in order to comprehend these conspiracies thoroughly and Again, it means throwing off a lot of illusions and a lot of BS you get from the news commentators and uh, the establishment news and reading as much as you can and figuring some of this out for yourself. The first fact about these assassination attempts on these various people is that the answers are there. I knew when I started 17 years ago to find out who killed John Kennedy, the answers were there. The network was there. Yes, it took a lot of hours, a lot of reading, a lot of studying. But when the House Select Committee came out a year ago and said there was a conspiracy to kill John Kennedy and Martin Luther King, and there were two gunmen at the grassy knoll, that wasn't new to us, and it wasn't new to you either, because all of you have heard this for years. And the frightening thing is the denial in the minds of people who just don't want to accept various truths about what is really happening in this world. They have to live with the consequences, but they don't want to study the truth. Uh, there was a five-part program this week on the life or an interview with Lillian Hellman, political activist, a renowned writer. And an interesting question was asked to her uh, by the young woman who was a very good interviewer. And she said, what is strength? Do you believe that you're strong? She asked Lillian Hellman. And Lillian Hellman's answer was, strength is being able to figure things out for yourself. Now, why does that take strength? Because when you read things as they are, you get the ridicule of people. They call you a communist. They call you crazy. They ask your motives. They want to know where your money comes from, who your family is. They don't. They want to know everything, but what is your source of information, and can I figure it out for myself. So the answer to who shot JP or who shot Ronald Reagan or any of these other people is there if you want to know it. And the second fact is that through the years, we have been told that the sleeping giant is a Soviet unit. I was brought up in a home that said, uh, Uncle Meyer always said, watch the big bear, watch the sleeping giant. And everybody watched Mount St. Helens and they watched Soviet Union night and day. The Russians have this, the Russians 
don't have that. We're ahead in space. They have no oil. The economy is collapsing. We watch everything they do except what we're doing. And the truth of the matter is that the sleeping giant in the world isn't the Soviet Union at all. It's the Muslim Empire going from North Africa to the Philippines. They control two things. They have access to two things that absolutely make the world go around beyond anything else. One is oil and the other narcotics. If you have opium and heroin and poppies and the things that you can make from those and the hashish, if you have those two, you also can control the world as much as the United States or Great Britain. Great Britain used the opium to control all of China and Southeast Asia for years and the French also. But once the Arabs realize in the Muslim world that it's theirs for their profit and you can take your hands off of it, they can shoot any religious leader they want or any political person they want because they own the two things we need. And with the profits of those, they can buy the farms, the foods, the banks, and have solid gold. You've got paper money that can be called in in a few hours. They have solid gold that they have used with the profits from the oil and from the uh, narcotics. And the tragedy is that we go through school not knowing an Arab, not knowing an Iranian, not knowing anything about the cultures, not wanting to know the schools treating the Arabs and the sub-levels, the blacks, the yellows, the oranges, the reds, as if they're not worth knowing. We study American history, we study Napoleon, we study British Empire, we know about Henry VIII and how many wives and what he did to their heads. We know nothing about a culture which exists today. It exists with aeroplanes, with fighter planes, with highly skilled weapons and mobility and bank accounts and uh, they can buy anything they want. They are a fact of life that our children and grandchildren are going to live with. And ignoring them and believing that we have control over them is wrong, and we will have to pay our dues for being so ignorant. Now, when this uh, um, Ajah said that John Paul is, he said he's a crusader commander, John Paul under the mask of a religious leader. Uh, in the book, The Final Conclave, a, book, a section on how John Paul II came to power, it tells about his role in playing, in productions. Uh, on page 49, it tells about his clandestine theatrical performance, his conspiratorial university classes, his underground group collaborations, his necessity for underground theater, the Rhapsody Theater and a, working as an actor and a co-producer and his passion for acting and his acting being fulfilled in his school dramatic societies and again on page 47, his uh, theatrical group. Well, at the same time in 1940 that this uh, young Carol was in a, a Nazi-occupied Poland and doing all of his underground theater work, Ronald Reagan was making his movies in 1942, 1940 at Warner Brothers with Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn was working for the Gestapo, Gestapo agent, and uh, you can read The Untold Story by Charles Hyman, and I've done many references on that. So you take an overlay of years where one actor in Hollywood becomes president of the United States from Warner Brothers and rules the world and uh, is a front man for forces much worse, if possible, that can remove him in seconds. He got the message, as did the Pope and uh, similar to the Godfather silencing. So you have one in a Rhapsody Theater, an actor in Poland under Nazi occupation in 1940, and you have an actor president of the United States who was making movies at the same time in Hollywood with Hitler's Gestapo. Hitler was in Poland and Hitler was in Hollywood, and both men thought they ruled the world. But under them and the people that selected those actors, there's blood and guts, and they're going for the jugular. So while they catapult these people in place, they better shape up or else. Uh, this pope studied uh, the theater and then went to Solvay Chemical and worked at a rock quarry, which was Auschwitz, and he worked for IG Farben, the chemical company that was exterminating the Jews, and I've done programs on this. Now, the fact is, as I said before, that these PR jobs on people like Earl Warren and Nixon and Reagan or the Pope sell the product, but how long will it work before some of their background and their career and the way 
they came to power, the tangled web of the Vatican in the OSS, and then it became the CIA. The Vatican has been, it allowed itself to become a branch of U.S. intelligence. And with that comes exploitation of populations, divisions of countries and their resources. And when you take religious institutions, whether it's Israel, and I can do many hours on Israel, or the Mormon Church, or the Vatican, but it was the Pope who was shot, and we're talking about the Vatican. When you tangle yourself with intelligence operations that are killing political leaders wanted by the majority, when you tangle yourself with bloodbaths of native populations, and you are linked to mob connections and mob-related profits that were necessary to put you in office, then you have to take the bullet when the bullet flies. That's why Ronald Reagan was blessing his alleged assassin, nearby assassin, and that's why the Pope was blessing the man, his assailant. One of the first per things they asked was uh, uh, about their assailants, and both of them were very anxious uh, to speak up and make sure that no hard feelings. This is, wasn't because that Regan and Pope John Paul are so gracious and godlike. Ronald Regan's first thing statement was, um, Hinckley comes from such a nice family. There's a marvelous article I'll go into detail in a, another week or two, but you can read in the meantime by Thomas Satz, May the 6th, 1981, in the Washington Post. Regan should let the jurors decide and the judges decide on Hinckley. How does he know he was a nice family? How does he know he has a problem? Maybe the solution was to shoot Regan. How does he know anything about the family? Maybe they wanted George Bush as president. Uh, Regan said the family must be devastated. And this well-known famous psychiatrist, Thomas says, says, how does he know that the family's devastated at all? They're about to move to Guatemala, and Guatemala is about to go into a bloodbath and wipe out the Indians and the native population and the father's link to the defense and CIA and defense offices, the AID. How do you know all these things? So John Paul immediately said, the, sent a message, the Pope harbors no resentment but is showing understanding and forgiveness for his assailant. And Ronald Reagan says, I feel sorry for the man. He must have such a nice family. Well, the first one of the first things that I... Uh, ja said when he shot was, uh, is the Pope alive? I didn't mean to kill him or I would have emptied my barrel. Well, what these two guys got was a message. You saw the Godfather with a horse in the head. They didn't kill the man who was going to climb into bed. They put a horse's head into his bed. Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II didn't get their cling, and the decisions they make will be made for them. And I assure you, and I'll talk about it many times in the future, that I assure you they got that message with the bullet holes in their body. They got it very loud and clear. But we have our illusions here, and until you break them, you can't ever find the truth. And what I'm talking about on these programs is my 17 years of research of where are the truths and where do you find them and how do you know when uh, a journalist is lying or the police are covering up? There's an article in the Monterey Herald this last week that didn't go over the major wire services. A good article on terror on the right. It says, the Pope attack shows that terror is universal, as likely from the right as left. It's written by their foreign correspondent in Europe, Fernand Aubergenois. And he made he talks about the uh, complications uh, of trying to blame the left for every assassination team. He says at a time when the U.S. senators are trying to study in their House Internal Committee the links of terrorism in Moscow, one of the most dramatic incidents in history of terrorism involves a murderer sentenced to death in absentia whose associates were men of the extreme right. Now, if Aubergenois did his homework, he would learn, as I have learned, that Lee Harvey Oswald and James Earl Ray and Sirhan Sirhan and Arthur Bremer and uh, Squeaky Fromm and Sarah Jane Moore and John Hinckley Jr. and Mark David Chapman and the Manson family and the SLA all came from the right. And as soon as they recognize this and have just a few more juicy murders or these people die or a few more leaders are killed, they're going to catch on where the terrorism has come. It's come from the same city, the same place in Chile. One of the first words he said when he was arrested, Aja, besides asking about the Pope, he said Chile and George Habash. 
and he let you know that this is a right-wing terrorist group of the worst kind, the farthest right. And does it come as a shock to the journalists all of a sudden to see that this isn't coming from the Soviet Union, that the right wing has assassins? Jack Anderson has written about Operation Condor, the Chilean operation team from Colonial Dignitad in Chile. Why can't other people in this country catch on? And why do they have to act so innocent when the bullets fly? Oh, we have assailants from the right wing. We better look again. Well, we'll take a half a half minute break, one minute break, and I'll get back with you some more on some of the motives and ideas behind the shooting of John Paul II. This concludes the first half of World Watchers International with May Russell. We will return with the second half after a brief pause. Okay, we'll go back into some more on who shot John Paul II. Um, along with that article in the Monterey Herald coming from Europe, that we better look into the terror on the right. This author said, in quotes, there have been many warnings from police and political authorities in Europe of the danger likely to arise from overly simplification of where the terror is coming from. He said the investigation of international terrorism is only in its early stages. The foreign correspondents looking into the matter can only accumulate facts. Conclusions are premature. Terrorism can both be political and economic. And anybody who lived through Nazi Germany knows that terrorism from, from the Nazis, from the far right, from the Savak, from the Dina in Chile is as dangerous or more fierce than anything that is going on in the prison camps in the Soviet Union. I'm not a communist and I'm not pro-Soviet, but if we stop looking at them, as I said before, and look at us and where are our people coming from, all those assassins or that I mentioned or would-be assassins that took pot shots were all organized from the right and that can be documented over and over again in books and uh, charts of the sources of where their money is coming from. Now, there's a woman uh, out pushing a book on all the talk shows and radio shows. Her name is Claire Sterling, and she got a book out called The Terror Network, and the purpose is to support and drum up the House Internal Committee looking for the terrorists on the left. Well, she hit 11 this time. She's in the Bay Area at the time the Pope was shot and, and with inter various interviews and people asked her, what about the CIA assassination teams and so forth? She admitted, yes, I know they exist, but my book is on the left, pushing more about this terror uh, from the left in Moscow and not from the right. And she's fall fallen into the same pitfall that uh, this journalist is talking about at the time. And they asked her, there's an article in the Los Angeles Times this week, who do you think shot John Paul II? And her answer was, the assailant was probably, see, she doesn't know, probably driven by fundamentalist Muslim motives rather than political reasons. A small fundamentalist sect, a fanatic zealot, uh, religious, now political reasons, with a visceral hatred of Christianity uh, and who blames Christianity for all the ills of the world and for the intrusion into the Muslim world. Now, she doesn't even make sense. What would this sect, this zealot sect, accomplish to shoot one pope? Because in three hours or 24 hours, they'd have another one elected, and he'd probably be meaner and angrier than this one. So if one tiny sect is fighting the the Vatican Empire, lots of luck. It doesn't even make sense, and she can't prove it. And the Pope, furthermore, is is sympathetic to the uh, PLO, the Palestinians. He's gotten along very well with the Middle Eastern countries, the Muslims. The Vatican recognizes 100 countries and not has never recognized the state of Israel. So I doubt that this group... And I'll go into the religious motives, but I doubt, and it's impossible, that one tiny fundamentalist sect would accomplish anything at all. Why would they get a guy out of a Turkish jail in November of 79 and let him travel and collect him and protect him all over uh, the continent of Europe and Southeast Asia and, and the Middle East, rather, just for the sake of an individual sect. They wouldn't have accomplished anything. Anyway, uh, one example of a more political motive than, than that 
kind of stuff that she throws out as an expert on terrorism it is an item that was in the UPI story, a, a copy sent to me from the Santa Barbara Press, April the 30th, 1981. There was a military junta in Spain, and they tried to take over. This again, if you make the comparison in Turkey, there is an extreme right group, just as, say, the king in Spain or Reagan in the United States, and a counterpart in Turkey, but a farther right, a bush Hague group wants to take over the uh, White House in this country, a farther right group, wants a, tried a coup that Aja was involved in his supporters and political supporters were involved in, in Turkey. And in Spain, just last month, there was a, an attempt to overthrow the king and queen of Spain, and there was an item in the newspaper, Spanish press reports that the Vatican and United States were contacted before the coup try. The Spanish papers had information that the military conspirators, before their attempt to overthrow the, ter the government, were in touch with the United States and the Vatican. And it was an internal matter. According to Haig, he turned his back away on it, and that's why he had to run to Spain and patch up the pieces, because he was going to let the coup come in power, which is consistent with the Haig that would follow behind if Regan's out of the way. But evidently, the Vatican was not in favor of um, this coup and was sitting on it and it did not please them. Now, the this report of this coup was April the 30th, 1981 in the Santa Barbara papers, but at that time, Aja was in Mallorca, Spain. He had $500 to take a two-week vacation into Spain just day after the coup failed and four days before he shot the Pope, he arrived in Rome from Spain with lots of money, Swiss money, Italian money, and a $500 trip to Spain. So did he meet those people in Spain that were thwarted because the Vatican didn't give them the go-ahead for the military? And was the Pope uh, almost killed or will die of complications or knocked out because he didn't go along with that? And this Aja works with that element that wants that extreme right wing in every country. Uh, that's just one example of a political link. There was a, a, a picture of Haig. I call him General Haig all the time. I don't like to call him Secretary of State. He wants to get those fangs out to, to the military branches, and he was with the Pope um, April the 3rd, 1981. The Pope sent a message out, which I had an article of about a month ago. Uh, there's some personal message delivered by hand because he said, my lines are tapped, I can't talk on the telephone, and I'm bugged. He realizes, like the others, that he's a captive in the White House. They've been bugged since World War II. The OSS and CIA have kept a tight lid on everything that goes in and out of the Vatican. But there was General Haig uh, at the Vatican April the third, uh, May the 3rd, one day before Aja arrived in Rome. Uh, Haig was with the Pope. And very often when these dignitaries arrive, something happens following and it seems maybe the dignitaries don't go away with the plan. I remember when Henry Kissinger went to Saudi Arabia to see King Faisal and wanted to keep uh, raise the oil prices. The Shah of Iran wanted to raise the oil prices and Faisal didn't want to. Kissinger visited him exactly like Haig visiting the Pope here. And then a couple of days later, King Faisal, I think it was 24 hours later, was dead. A nephew uh, was charged and was decapitated. No trial of any kind it followed Kissinger's visit to Faisal. And as soon as Faisal was dead, the oil prices went up and the Shah of Iran had his way and the prophets went into chase Manhattan Bay. Well, the selling of the Pope and the idea, the image that they don't get into political affairs is a vision that you have to have erased from your mind. The Vatican is, has been, and always was political. Now, there was a first in terms of political assassinations that I've never seen in the American news media, but somehow or other, they seem just a little more intelligent over in Europe, or they're going to be forced. The Times are forcing them to ask questions they never asked, so that the Los Angeles Times had an article by Lewis Fleming, uh, May the 15th, was there a conspiracy 
to kill the Pope. Where are the where is the money that put up this uh, activity of Aja? How did he have protection and accomplices? He had them beyond debate. It is certain. And they're looking into his travels, and they, as I say, arrested the police in uh, Turkey, one of them, for giving him a false passport. Well, that problem isn't solved because he had three aliases, and that was only one of them. But the European press is asking questions more than we ever had in the United States, and I never understood why the newspaper in America couldn't ask these questions. In Rome, they're saying, did he have connections with international terrorist group, and they're not afraid of the right or left? What was the source of his money? Why did he make a quick trip to Palermo, Sicily in December? Why uh, the two-week vacation from Milan to Mallorca, Spain, four days before the Pope was shot? Uh, those are some of the questions they're asking. Uh, who trained him to shoot was in the Italian press. Who helped him escape from Turkey? Who paid for his wandering throughout Europe? They want to know who paid for wandering. We have the wandering as the motive. They're wanderers, Saran, and John Hinckley, the loan of the wanderer. They just, Arthur Brammer, who shot at George Wallace. Uh, we think that wandering is a cause or a sickness. In Europe, they think that somebody paid for the wandering, and I don't know how they get so smart and why we're so dumb. But eventually, we have to start asking some hard questions, and uh, these have never been asked in this country. We don't ask if it's a conspiracy. We don't want to know who put up the money, where they traveled. I asked those questions, would you believe it, 17 years ago, before the Warren Report was published, before the government printing office got out the commission hearings on um, who killed uh, John Kennedy, the Warren Commission hearings that I ordered. I asked, where did Lee Harvey Oswald go from the Marines to La Havre, France? He went home to see his mother on a quick discharge when he wasn't supposed to be out of the Marines and goes to New Orleans and go to La Havre, France and Finland and into Moscow and Minsk. And he wants to come home. He writes and says, give me the money. I'm ready to come home and brings a Russian wife. And he's met at the harbor by the International Rescue Committee, the anti-communist leagues, the CIA organizations and the CIA brings his Russian wife, Marina Oswald, through the Greek Orthodox Church into Fort Worth and then Dallas, and then he's in New Orleans and, and Miami and Mexico and back to Dallas and ends up right at the Texas School Book Depository where John Kennedy's car is going to pass and a rifle that he allegedly held has no fingerprints and there's no account for the trips or who he saw or where he went. Now, the Dallas police had to solve that by about eight or ten hours, a district attorney, Wade, could say, uh, we have him, he, that's the lone assassin. Why can't we ask these questions? There are researchers in this country, and there are 215, 20 books critical of the Warren Commission hearings, but why are there so few of us? Why do we accept the uh, stories as they come off the wire services so easily? Isn't it more important to know the real truth? Now, when this uh, assailant was arrested, he was very quick to say several things that were contradictory. As I say, the first thing he, he asked is, is the Pope alive? And then he also gave one press interview, which is interesting, and he says, the reason I killed the Pope is because, well, the Pope is alive, and he's referring to him as having killed him. Now, he knows the difference, and I thought that was interesting, a direct quotation from the newspaper, The Confession, where he said, I killed alone. Uh, at, this was a uh, day after the assailant had shot at the Pope, and he had first inquired, is he alive? They said he's alive, and he was still alive. We gave the press interview, and he said, I killed alone, knowing the man is alive. So there's something funny about uh, his state of mind or whether he is under mind control or has been taught to kill the Pope, and he, th he keeps saying, I killed the Pope. He says, I'm neither a fascist, nor a gauchist, nor an anarchist. I killed alone. I am not the member of any illegal organization. Now, that's a matter of interpretation. In Turkey, he may think that he's a member of a legal organization and that the United States government and Alexander Haig and NATO have usurped the Turkish political system and that they are the legitimate organization of the Turkish government that were replaced by the American profit motive of dividing the Muslim community, which he says they are trying to do. 
And then, of course, the United States uh, and the international assassination teams always try to make it very easy by leaving a diary. The Harvey Oswald, Sir Han, Sir Han, James Earl Ray, John Hinckley. Now they leave letters at the hotel room. So he leaves a draft in his pocket when Aja is arrested. But again, it's a contradictory uh, draft. He said, I have killed the Pope again so that the world knows of the victims of imperialism. I am a pro-Palestinian communist comrade, a follower of George Habash. Well, that is, is filled with contradictions that I will go into in the next couple of weeks to come. You can't be a communist comrade and work for George Habash. Habash has tentacles, again, to Colonial Dignitat, to DeKalb County in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, to the Alpha 66, the teams of assassination groups that go all over the world, and they're not communist by a long shot. And being a pro-Palestinian doesn't make sense because um, he's not a comrade, and once he said he was a Marxist, because, as I said before, the Pope recognizes the PLO. He thinks that they should be a legitimate uh, country and organization. There's no reason to shoot the Pope because of the Palestinian reason, because he already recognizes the PLO and is doing everything in their power. So when he's arrested, there's always the deniability that agents and carefully trained agents have of linking the communists. I'm a Marxist uh, from Chile working with the hunter there. Uh, there's no way it will work. Now, if you don't want to admit a conspiracy, uh, the Rome police will cover up with a tiny little, little bit of a local accomplice. They're not yet ready to bite the bullet for the big conspiracy. There's one thing that you have to understand, and that is that the Rome police are no different than the Los Angeles Police Department or the New York Police Department or the San Francisco or Atlanta, Georgia, or any other police department. This pope is a Polish pope. He's an outsider, for one thing. And he may be making decisions they don't appreciate for another thing. And the state of minds of most the police officials that have control of investigating these affairs are with that far, far right as against the right. The uh, put them back in the torture rack of the Middle Ages right as against, uh, I, as I say, the Turkish government. Amnesty International said you keep people in a chair five days to interrogate them, plus a lot of other things. And they answered back last week, five days in a chair is not unusual. Of course, with beatings and clobbers on the head and twisted bones and whatever they're doing, uh, NATO's having trouble recognizing Turkey as it is. And there's something more right than that, that no, NATO or the United Nations or hardly anybody could stomach. So there is uh, a difference that you have to make between the conservative right and the far, far right. Reagan defined it two nights before he was shot, the gridiron and dinner, when he said the right wing doesn't know what the far right is doing. Well, he found out two days later in front of the Hinckley uh, bullet that hit him at that time. So the, the question about why trust the Italian police force this week, uh, New York Times, it was May 15th, the Rome police said that Aja had no accomplices in St. Peter's Square and none in all probability elsewhere in Rome or Italy. Now, why in the world would they say that? Uh, today, on the 17th of May, they were talking about discrepancies in the wound locations. They're trying to fit the amount of wounds into their fit conclusions about that one man, as happened in all the other conspiracies. Today they said the Pope may have been hit by two bullets instead of three. I don't see how four days later they can't figure out how many holes was in that body. I mean, forget it's a Pope. How can they not figure out how many po uh, bullet holes got into him? Or if even a Regan's body, if a bullet comes from where Hinckley stood, how can it be ricocheted from a car, which is a totally different angle? Another account in the newspaper last week is that uh, this is from the Associated Press the day after he was shot. Other suspects were allowed to get away, but they limited to one. Two people were arrested. A third was sought, but the police later said that only one gunman was involved. If 
Two people were arrested and a third was involved. Remember the Dealey Plaza uh, photographs of three suspects taken off Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, and then allowed to leave. This has happened in every single one of these major assassination attempts or to silence these people. There is a backup team. There's no single crazy fluke just unloading his pistol and hoping he hits the guy that well. They're well-trained. They have a backup team. They can go simultaneously. In fact, one woman that was hit by the bullet that was in the line of fire was waving an American flag, and she had interesting background we could go into later. And the necessity for the police to solve this in 24 hours does go on in Italy. And while they said he had no accomplices in St. Peter's and none in all probability in Rome or Italy, they had absolutely no reason to say that. They've issued uh, warrants for possible assailants. They don't know where to look for them. The reason they don't look for them is that they can't ask the right questions. But eventually, as I said before, they're going to have to uh, do something more than send warrants for unknown persons. Um, if it was a single terrorist, it would be easy, they announced in Italy. The Rome prosecutor says if it was a single one, that would be easy. Of course it would be easy. He said, I don't think this will be a quick trial. This will be a long investigation. Well, you haven't seen uh, Mark David Chapman tried for shooting John Lennon. You haven't seen John Hinckley's face. They said that trial won't begin till the end of the year until they put some hand-picked judges, and they may use a mental defense, and he won't go to prison at all. They issued warrants for unknown persons. In Italy, said they're not convinced it was an international conspiracy. Well, Aja, as I say, one of the first words he said, a code word, was George Habash. He said Chile, which have links to the Chilean junta with their assassination teams that go all over the world. He lived in West Germany. Uh, he had a German wife. They tried to extradite him. Germans protected him, wouldn't send him back to Turkey. Visits to Spain three times in Rome, down in Palermo and Sicily and in Milan. How can this not, when you take the Chilean, German, uh, and with their links also uh, to all the major countries, Zurich, Switzerland, and uh, London, this ball of wax, how can it not be an international conspiracy? There came a time in Watergate when John Ehrlichman said, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And there's going to come a time after 17 years of political assassination where you're going to see the uh, pieces fall into place. And it will look simple to you then because you will have heard uh, various researchers, Sherman Skolnick or myself, or other people who've done work writing newspaper articles talking about uh, these assassins and where they come from. Later, it'll fall into place and you'll say, oh, yes, I've heard that before. But in admitting the mobility of these assassins, where they meet, where they bank, where they get their aliases, their passports, uh, a lot of work has to go back to point one, the political assassination of uh, John Kennedy. He lost the election to Richard Nixon, who was a mob figure. And uh, in the next few weeks, I'll go into the mob connections of Nixon and Reagan and Sinatra and the organized crime to, directly to the Vatican as motives for the necessity to shoot John Paul at this time. But uh, right now, I'll go into various uh, points that built up to this. These people have mobility and finances. Pierre Salinger was on ABC News saying what makes European thing, uh, people, figures, um, think that it's a larger conspiracy was they're asking the question, how did he get his money to travel? Who was behind him? Imagine ABC News having an American, Pierre Salinger, who was press secretary to John Kennedy, asking questions of who shot John Paul II when the press secretary of the dead president wouldn't ask them, and we pleaded with him to ask those questions in 1963 and 64. It takes Pierre Salinger living in Europe on American broadcasting to ask questions that should be all over the world every time these people are shooting and poking holes into political leaders, religious leaders, uh, civil rights people, as I say, judges, lawyers, writers, actors, uh, literally thousands of people that have been felled by the bullet but we discussed the most prominent most of the time. Uh, he was asking questions about the Browning Automatic. At first they thought it came from Bulgaria. 
again, they tried to make a Marxist Russian story. The gun came from behind. The Soviet Union blocked the Iron Curtain. Bulgarian, and he's a Marxist with Habash in Hadad. Uh, that's BS. They finally admitted the gun came from Belgium. Not that it matters much, but it matters a lot that they, they couldn't wash off a Russian terrorist Marxist uh, poking holes into Pope John Paul II. The Russians must be sitting back absolutely laughing in delight. They have revealed stories about our assassinations. When Ronald Reagan was inaugurated for president, his first speech was about the Russian terrorists. Uh, the things they do, they're spreading assassination teams and terror all over the world. And the answer from the head of the Soviet Union, and I had on KLRB, was, you better clean up your act. You killed John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and many, many others, and Torres down in Bolivia, and Lumumba, and, and uh, Patrice Lumumba, and Che Guevara, and the Soviet Union rattled off a list of who's who, of who've been murdered by this network with, again, Washington, Houston, Texas, Germany, Chilean network that is not hard to trace, and it isn't a coincidence in Spain that this uh, Ja came from that exact ball of wax and has lived with these people after murdering a liberal newspaper man in Turkey. Would they deport him to be put to the firing squad for killing a liberal alternative press newsman in Turkey? No, they fund him and jump up and down with joy. He proved that he could do the job, and that's why he was out of jail. That's why he could travel, travel all over the world, because he shot a liberal newspaper man. You get brownie points for that. You don't go back to jail. So here was Salinger asking questions uh, over our ABC that we can't ask. Uh, May Russell can't ask him on ABC, and neither will Salinger on a program ask about our assassinations. But he's asking, was he alone? Was he a part of an international conspiracy as an agent? How did he travel through Hungary, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Italy, Spain, Germany? And he had this uh, Belgian weapon. It wasn't a Russian weapon, and he's not a Marxist. And he told the people when he was arrested, I had no financial problems. You bet your bottom dollar he had no financial problems, and they were warning today that he may possibly escape. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised with the great leniency uh, the Pope has uh, put on him and the way that Regan has done to his assailant. Hell, they're glad to be alive, and I, they may let these guys escape. He may, in fact, escape, but he said, I had no problems. And when he was arrested, he had a lot of Swiss and Italian banknotes, and he also had a, a two-week vacation in Spain. It cost about $500 to travel in Spain. They admitted that he committed no robberies and no burglaries. Now, that's a first in terms of assassination stories and um, uh ABC News with Pierre Salinger. We always say that James L. Ray robbed banks or they came through this money through some subterfuge. They're being so upfront uh, part of the way, and I think that's interesting. Now, because time is running out, I'm briefly going to go into just a few of the possible motives and next week continue this and rule them out for you and explain what I think that some of these motives are uh, or are not. One, was it a, a Christian Muslim motive? No, I don't believe it was, and I'll tell you why next week. I don't, even though the Muslims and finding the Christians in Lebanon, I don't believe that at all. I don't think that this handful of Muslims, as I say, is going to wipe out the Vatican Empire, and they work very well with them, and there's no possible reason for uh, doing that at this time. Uh, was it a far-right group that wanted to kill John Paul II? And I'll go into those tentacles. There's, as I say, the far, far-right, uh, such as the Spanish military, Junta, the Turkish group, and uh, some of the Americans, and so forth. Was it a religious group? There's the Carl McIntyre gang, the born-again Christians, the Southwest, uh, Southern Tennessee, Texas, Dallas, Texas, the Hinckley gang are violently anti-Catholic, but I don't think they took these shots because they'd still end up with the Vatican anyway. And was it the narcotic intertangling web of the narcotic group? And as I weave these possible motives into it, I think it goes more into the far uh, a right-wing narcotic traffic market of the group that are trying to control Turkey and the Middle East and the profits of the opium 
as against the heavy involvement of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and Watergate people who are still in power, tangling the Vatican money to the point it, it even linked directly to that Nugenhan Bank in Australia I've been talking about, to the CIA in Southeast Asia, to heroin opium. There are too many stories of breaking, and I'll go into the motives with you next week on the far-right motives, the anti-Catholic motives, and the narcotics, because I think that uh, most possibly the reason for this assailant being used at this time has more with the economic narcotic traffic of that golden horn of the Middle East versus the Southeast Asian South American gang that tried to monopolize the world narcotics for so long through Sicily, drying up the Corsicans in Marseille. Those are a lot of names and words to throw at you, but I know you want some explanation of motives, so you'll have to follow it for the weeks to come. We don't have any more time, and we'll get back to who shot uh, the Pope, John Paul II, uh, next week on KLRB. In the meantime, this is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. This has been World Watchers International with noted conspiracy investigator Mae Brussel. This program originates from Carmel, California. KLRB Carmel by the Sea. Here's Bob Marley. Mm -hmm.